What I'd like to talk about today is the uh, foundations of portfolio theory. When this idea came to me, I was a student, I was a PhD candidate. Um, I was taking a course under Koopmans called uh, Activity Analysis, and he distinguished between uh, efficient and inefficient allocations of resources. And uh, well, I had, e I obviously had efficient and inefficient, uh, you know, portfolios. And so the the term uh, efficient portfolio came uh, as a result of my taking this course on the Kuzmans. Well, I was at the stage uh, w where I had to pick a, a dissertation topic. Yes. So I went to my advisor, uh, Yasha Marshak, uh, and he was busy when I got there. And uh, so I wa waited in his uh, uh, ante room. And there was another fellow in the ante room uh, who turned out to be a broker waiting for Marshak. So we chatted, you know, while we were here. And uh, he suggested that I should uh, maybe do a dissertation uh, on the stock market. So I went in. A stockbroker gave you the idea? Yeah, that's right. A stock <laughs> that's right. A tip so, that paid off. <laughs> yeah. Uh, some uh, biographers uh, of mine said uh, this was the best advice a stockbroker has ever given. Uh, I seem to have specialized in sort of theoretical things which then became practical. In fact, the way to measure whether some theoretical thing, some operations research or uh, analytic thing, is in fact uh, uh, a contribution to uh, the theory of rational behavior under uncertainty that you, that you could really use, is to see, see it used in practice. Just uh, sitting there in the uh, library at the uh, University of Chicago where this, these ideas first uh, arrived, I thought that people could actually use this. But uh, to think that, hey, that means billions of dollars, trillions of dollars will be uh, managed uh, using this, uh, that, that really didn't strike me. I was working at RAND, uh, RAND Corporation in Santa Monica, and um, I was, I'd been on a trip to uh, RAND Corporation in uh, uh, Washington, D.C., but I stopped off in Chicago to defend my dissertation. And I remember landing at Midway Airport then, uh, that was way back when, and uh, uh, thinking to myself, now, you know, I know this field cold, not even Milton Friedman can give me a hard time. Okay? <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> Temp, not the devil. <laughs> <laughs> so about five minutes into my defense, uh, Friedman says, well, Harry, I've read this. I don't find any mistakes in the math, but uh, this is not a dissertation in economics, and we can't give you a PhD in economics for a dissertation that's not in economics. And he kept repeating that, you know, for the next hour and a half. My palms began to sweat. And um, um, at one point, he says, uh, uh, you, you, have a tr you have a problem. It's uh, not economics. It's not mathematics. It's not business administration. And Yasha Marshak said, it's not literature. <laughs> <laughs> so after about an hour and a half, they sent me out to the hall, in the hall. And about five minutes later, uh, Marshak came out and said, congratulations, Dr. Markowitz. <laughs> You elected to publish the first article from your dissertation in the journal Finance. Happened to have brought the issue with me. Oh, well. I brought with me also the very first publication of the journal Finance and included two years' worth of proceedings from the annual meetings, plus all of the articles that the profession <laughs> had produced uh, in the two years of 1946 and 1947. This is the issue that you elected to um, publish your Nobel laureate address in. So this is now going to be <laughs> this year. This year's volume <laughs> of the journal Finance. <laughs> this is the Merchant of Venice, uh, Antonio speaking. Uh, somebody says, uh, why are you know, why are you sad? Is your you know business going bad? And he says, uh, my ventures are not in one bottom trusted, nor to one place, nor is my whole estate upon the fortune of this year, of this present year. Therefore, my, mer uh, my merchandise makes me not sad. So that means that not only did he know that you're not supposed to put all your eggs in one basket, but he understood covariance. In a, yes. In a, in a <laughs> Let's go back to uh, uh, John Burr Williams. So uh, he said that uh, uh, if, um, uh, uh, if, if you're in doubt, if something's uncertain, you should go according to the mean. Uh, I, have, I have an article uh, which I published in the Financial Analyst Journal. Uh, you'll excuse the plug for another <laughs> journal. Uh, <laughs> on uh, 
the early history of portfolio theory, yes. 1600 to 1960, right. If something uh, had risk in it, uh, well, you didn't have to really worry about that because with sufficient diversification, you could eliminate the risk. Now, if, uh, if risks were uh, independent, if, if, the, if, re if returns were uncorrelated with each other, then if you diversify enough, you can make the variance of the average, the variance of the portfolio, go away. But when risks are correlated, they don't go away. There's something uh, uh, in uh, uh, chapter five, I think, of my, <laughs> my 1959 book called The uh, Law of the Average Covariance. And it says when uh, things are uh, uh, correlated, when risks are correlated, then uh, when you diversify increasingly, if you equal weight and diversify, uh, variance doesn't go to zero, variance goes to the average covariance, and that can be very substantial. Uh, how many, in your, your 1952 article, how many securities did you use to illustrate the basic principles? Um, well, um, I didn't do any computation. Correct. Right. And so I, uh, I remember P Peter Bernstein uh, commenting on the example that I used. And since I had absolutely no experience with finance, I, it was sort of a silly example. I think I said, uh, uh, if you put all your money in 60 railroads or something like that, uh, it wouldn't be well diversified. And he p pointed out many years later that there weren't 60 railroads around. <laughs> so uh, that was a purely theoretical, uh, pure, theoret pure theoretician should not give examples. Uh, but uh, by the time this book came out, uh, I had had somebody uh, collect uh, time series on 10 securities, uh, nine securities, and then I did a 10 security example with uh, nine securities in cash. There was actually uh, a, a 25 security example that I had planned. I had uh, thought that uh, the way you got inputs was to ask security analysts or to You got your first tip from them, so. Right, well, <laughs> uh, well I was a broker. <laughs> but, <laughs> right. Um, the, um, uh, so I wanted to use uh, uh, security analysts. Uh, these, these are actually the uh, 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 CFO and assistant CFO or something like that of, of Yale that, that filled out these forms. And I was going to do a 25 security example, but we could never get it to work. I, I usually try to avoid predicting things. Uh, but I think one safe prediction is that the future will be uncertain, just like the past and the present <laughs> are uncertain. Uh, so we have, uh, we're in the information age, and we've got all these, uh, this uh, information zipping around, and some of it gets into print, and lots of it gets into our database. So we, we have this, this fact, uh, this, this piece of information, like the, the earnings of a company, which, of course, might be a lie or it might be a misprint, uh, or, or it might be an honest error, or it might be even correct. Uh, and I'm not saying they're all lies, but, uh, you know. And somehow we have to uh, give uh, advice, you know, we have to advise people on how to, how to invest their 401k despite the fact that uh, it's an uncertain world. Uh, there's uh, uh, not only are the, uh, not only is information about, um, individual stocks uncertain, but what will be the, uh, 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 the average return over the long run of stocks as compared to bonds is still uh, uh, subject to quite a bit of controversy. Like uh, some people look at the past and say stocks did, you know, 10% on average or, you know, before or after uh, inflation. And other people say, well, during that same period, uh, the uh, price earnings ratio has gone up considerably and you wouldn't expect it to go up as considerably in the future and therefore you won't have as much return in the future as in the past. So there's a range of uncertainty uh, among as to uh, what the market as a whole, the stock market as a whole do, will do over the next uh, many years. And uh, I think that's good. The world is uncertain and we have to uh, uh, continue to, uh, to, to act in the face of that uncertainty. In, in the uh, Chilean system, uh, there has, it, there's good and bad. Uh, they can only uh, invest in a particular, uh, you know, certain designated approved pension funds. Now, these pension funds aren't told what to invest in, 
but they are told that if they perform too far below the median pension fund, uh, they will be penalized, that they will have to take money out of their, uh, um, their uh, fees and put it back into, into the fund. So uh, that's good and bad. It uh, keeps people from going you know, off the deep end, but it also tends to make everybody um, go in lockstep. Uh, so uh, uh, maybe uh, the right thing would be to uh, have people pick among uh, a list of pension managers where the pension managers had sufficient diversification, but had some variety as to whether they were uh, 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 a little bit more aggressive or a little, you know, higher on the frontier or lower on the frontier. I think it's uh, uh, perfectly reasonable that uh, uh, people should ask uh, what is the real be behavior of investors as distinguished from what would be the rational behavior. Uh, so I don't necessarily subscribe to uh, each article that's come out, each view that's come out by the behavioral economist, but I think that's a reasonable activity to pursue. Uh, if you have some kind of behavioral theory about how people in the market do behave, put it inside the simulation and then see whether the simulation then comes out with market behavior like you know, at the macro level like you observe. So it, uh, it's a way of seeing whether the uh, behavioral theories add up to market behavior. You will see in that 1959 book, not only does chapter 9 uh, propose semi-variance as an alternate to chapter 7's or most chapters uh, uh, mean and variance, but back in the uh, oh, chapters 11, 12, 13, uh, 10, 11, 12, 13, something like that, uh, I explain to the reader what expected utility and personal probability is, and then I do some, uh, some experiments uh, where I say, suppose you only knew the mean and variance of a portfolio, how good could you do at guessing what expected utility was? And uh, if the probability distribution wasn't spread out too much, like if, if the probability distribution was mostly from a, like a 30% loss to a 40% gain, then um, the quadratic approximation to the utility function was quite close, and the, the mean variance guess would be quite close to actual expected utility. The 1979 Levy and Markowitz paper comes to the conclusion that uh, um, for uh, all sorts of historical distributions of returns, if you know mean and variance, you can guess expected utility quite close. But if you look at the actual uh, uh, approximation, if you draw the quadratic approximation and the utility function, um, you see that the thing that makes this work is that, again, over a, a range from 30% loss to 40% gain, uh, the, two approxi the approximation is quite good. And uh, when, uh, uh, when this experiment was being computed, I, I called uh, the guy who was actually doing the calculation and said, look at these annual returns on these uh, uh, investment companies. Uh, to what extent do they go between 30% loss and 40% gain? And, he looked and he said, they all do. He said, I can't lose. And, and in fact, we didn't. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, but uh, if you imagine uh, situations where somebody could uh, lose more than 30% of the portfolio or could gain more than 40% on the portfolio, then the mean variance approximation breaks down. Uh, I would get a letter like uh, um, so somebody saying, uh, I'm a, uh, a, a broker or I'm really a, I, I'm in a brokerage firm, but I, uh, I give finan you know, financial advice, I, and we use the efficient frontier, and, you know, uh, and I'm having a, a discussion with another broker who also is using the official front efficient frontier to, uh, to uh, give financial advice. I say that uh, you should only use the data from 1950 onward, and my colleague says you ought to use the whole history from 1927 onward. Uh, that's you know, available to us, including 1929 and so on and so forth. And uh, uh, I would reply back again, uh, I'm not one to predict, but uh, I, I feel that we're picking a, you know, we're picking from a, you know, nature is picking from a, a probability distribution, and somewhere in that probability distribution there's another 1929. Now maybe it doesn't have exactly the same frequency as its you know, historical frequency, but I would, I would be feel happier to uh, do an analysis based on some kind of an estimate that there is a 29 still in the bag someplace. Uh, 
markets need regulation, you know, and markets need laws. So uh, to a certain extent, uh, businessmen uh, re rely on each other's word, but also they re rely on there being laws there which are appropriate. So uh, subject to the constraint that there be reasonable laws and somebody there to enforce it, I do believe in the invisible hand. I do believe uh, in, you know, Adam Smith, the vision of labor, and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and so on. Uh, now, uh, you might, uh, you didn't ask, but I'll, I'll volunteer how portfolio theory uh, fit, fits into, into here. The fact that, uh, uh, that people are, are competing to uh, serve the same market or to find a, a market niche. Uh, or, but but uh, once somebody uh, 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 finds a market niche, other people will come in and try to, you know, uh, outdo them there. Uh, that has two consequences. One is everybody has to try very hard, and that's what the, uh, Adam Smith uh, described as, uh, uh, as why the, uh, the, the butcher and the baker or the candlestick maker uh, does a good job so that you'll come back to him. The other thing is if you want to invest in one of these people, you don't know who's going to win. So uh, the flip side of, uh, of the, the invisible hand is the uncertainty that it causes. And, uh, and that's why we diversify. Uh, that's why we have portfolio theory. Uh, and I think that uncertainty uh, has uh, always existed and continues to exist. If you, if you just have 100,000 and nobody is offering you any special services like uh, like are now being offered to the 401k participants uh, uh, what should you do and uh, there uh, I would uh, put some in a broadly diversified uh, uh, I was about to uh, give you my routine answer for the last 50 years but a broadly diversified uh, investment company but maybe I now uh, switch to a you know an, an index fund uh, and uh, and some in uh, spiders and part yes. of the money into something uh, uh, l you know, less volatile. Okay. And, and you should look at uh, you should look at a picture of the you know the uh, the S and P 500 or, uh, okay. or since since 1927 or because that's a, how long Ibbotson's charts go or something like that. Um, and maybe I uh, and maybe if push come to shove, uh, uh, I'd say yeah maybe you ought to have a little small cap. Maybe, maybe I'd rather go to the the five thousand, the three thousand, or the five thousand. Okay. I, I I think as a uh, as a practical matter, uh, that if it's just the person by themselves, uh, you know, without uh, an advisor, that uh, that's better than what they're likely to do. Okay. Otherwise, okay. It's certainly better than having them listen to the. Uh, uh, the television set. And it's it's better than having them invest in whatever did what really did well last last month. There's studies that uh, show that uh, if uh, you end up at retirement time, uh, uh, you know, at age 65, and you put all your money into uh, bonds or cash, you're going to have a lot of trouble if you live to 85 or something like that. And uh, so uh, uh, the uh, these. 401k advisory services now do Monte Carlo simulations to uh, see how well you would do if you followed various strategies, uh, uh, both up to retirement time and be beyond retirement time. And I think that can contribute to good decision. The other question is, um, is it possible for uh, maybe an advisor to guide them better? Mm -hmm. So we know that uh, 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 that uh, small caps tend to, uh, you know, on the average over the long run, have higher return than big caps, and uh, 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 and emerging markets uh, have somehow managed to have her very high returns on the average than uh, than everything else, but uh, tremendous volatility and so on. And so it uh, might be that uh, if you ask what. What combinations of these asset classes, uh, you know, real, subject to realistic constraints, uh, are efficient for the uh, the plunger and the and the widow and orphan kind of uh, thing? You get a frontier. What I'm saying is that I think uh, uh, 
an advisor can uh, uh, an advisor can come up with uh, asset class mixes, a variety of asset class mixes, uh, some of which are more suitable to one kind of investor and some are more suitable to another kind of investor. I was getting a course on portfolio theory uh, for the uh, math department at the uh, Tokyo University. The head of uh, uh, the math department called me and said, you just won the Nobel Prize in Economics. And this uh, fellow at the uh, public radio station, the public television station, would like to interview. Once an hour, there'd be news uh, you know, in English at, uh, from, the, uh, uh, from one of the state, uh, from one of the stations, the, uh, uh, the Armed Forces station down there. And we heard from, you know, right, uh, Mark Richard and uh, Miller got the Nobel Prize. And we called the guy at, uh, the uh, public television station um, said he'd like to do an interview. And I said, well, I think I have a little time sometime, you know, tomorrow afternoon about 2 p.m. He says, no, 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 we want to be on the 9 o'clock news. <laughs> <laughs> so he came out and everything went very fast. So here's uh, the uh, a bronze or brass uh, replica of the, uh, of the Nobel medallion.